Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go! Hello friends and elite achievers, welcome back. It's so good to be with you again this week. This is the fourth interview I've had today for Modern Leadership, and I am pumped up and motivated. If you've been listening to the podcast the past couple of weeks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We have had some incredible leaders, authors, and entrepreneurs on the show. We have been so lucky to learn from experts, and I see no reason to stop that trend. Today, we are sitting down with Jacob Badsgard. Jacob is the founder of Disruptive Advertising. His business is helping businesses advertise profitably on Google and Facebook by leveraging software and his experienced team of marketers. Why is this important? Well, on average, 76% of AdWords and Facebook ad budgets are wasted. You hear that toilet flushing? That is your money going bye bye In just three and a half years and under Jacob's leadership, disruptive advertising grew from nothing to $9 million annually with 60 employees. He did all this with zero debt of outside funding, a strong corporate philanthropy mindset, and upwards of $1,000 a week on snacks for the office. Jacob is a regular contributor to Forbes.com, Entrepreneur.com, and today he is our modern leader expert. Jacob, so great to have you with us. How are you today? Jake, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. A couple of Jakes just hanging out on the show. Uh, You know, we share an alma mater as well. So this is going to be a fun conversation. But before we jump into it, what we miss by way of intro? A couple of things that uh, come to mind immediately are uh, family. I have three daughters and uh, definitely one of the driving forces behind what we do. And uh, not having any business, technically business partners in the relationship, definitely get a lot of value from uh, running things by my spouse and, and, and having her support and buy-in as well. Spousal business partner. You know, I think today I feel the same way. You know, I, I mentioned in the intro, this is my fourth podcast today. And after every episode that I record, I run down and I talk to my wife and I tell her the stories and I ask her questions about what's interesting to her. And I think the spousal business partner is such an important role, someone to bounce ideas off of and feedback. And of course, it sounds like you're surrounded by the female influence in the home. You go out, you start this business. Tell us about disruptive advertising. Yeah. You know, there was this moment when I was still in uh, corporate America where I was sitting down for my annual review and uh, what was, you know, a top performer in the organization. And they sat down and said, Hey, you know, this is super exciting. I'm going to be able to get you a 9% raise for this year. And As I was thinking in my mind about what we'd accomplished in the past year, my contribution to the business, I thought, wow, that's great for them. Um, And I don't know that this is for me anymore. (laughs) So that was my moment where I said, okay, not upset, um, but realized that I wanted to contribute at my highest level. And that in corporate America, I started to find that whether I perform, you know, if I performed at this level, I'd get paid about the same. And if I performed at a super high level, I was really going to get paid a, not that much more. And I was really looking for an opportunity where the more I put in, the more I could get out. And of course, that exists in corporate America or working for other organizations. Um, ultimately, I found my way was starting my own business. And um, disruptive advertising comes from my background, which was Uh, doing analytics consulting. I worked at Adobe and Omniture for a few years uh, consulting Fortune 100 companies on how to implement web analytics to be able to effectively measure what every digital marketing dollar they spent was producing from a revenue standpoint. And when I saw that even some of the largest companies in the world did not know how to do this, I thought, well, if these guys don't know how to do it, certainly small and medium sized business don't know how to do this. And um, my initial thought was I would become this independent analytics consultant. But what I found was that time and time and time again, the areas to leverage those analytics and to drive real meaningful value for the businesses were optimizing AdWords and Facebook campaigns. And so the business model kind of evolved into, yeah, every client we work with, we take the time to make sure the analytics are set up correctly to see that end to end tracking from eyeball on an ad to revenue in the bank. Um, but where we're helping on the execution side is 
in optimizing and growing revenue through those AdWords and Facebook campaigns. And so that that's kind of where things got going. And it's crazy, you know, uh, my bio, since, you know, we, we put that together, we've actually had quite a bit of growth. Uh, we actually just surpassed our, um, we have over 100 employees now, and we've now worked with over 1,500 businesses, and that's all in about four years. And so things are going really well because it's something that just isn't really happening in the marketplace. Well, that's a massive hockey curve up for you and your business and is tremendous growth, especially when you look at in just the last half year, you've basically doubled your staff and you're really climbing. I want to talk to you a little bit about how you've gone about marketing and finding clients. But before I do, I want to take you back to that story you told about leaving corporate America and basically coming to this realization that you put in all this effort and 9% raise was really not what you felt you were worth as far as you felt like your contribution was higher than that. And I want to ask you the difference between this mindset of, I think I can really go out and make an impact and do this on my own versus someone that just feels entitled, someone that just says, you know, look, I came to work every day from nine to five and I was late maybe half the time, but most of the time I was on time, I deserve a big raise. What's the difference <laughs> in mindset between, you know, this entitlement and this go-getter hungry, I'm going to make a difference? You know, it's interesting um, for anyone listening, I actually put a lot of thought and detail into writing an article about this that's just on my LinkedIn account that you can go and read there about how to get paid what you deserve, what you deserve at the end of the day. And, um, the difference is when I looked at my billable rate in terms of what I was billing my clients compared to the peer set, um, that I was working with. And when I looked at the upsells and licensing that I was doing compared to my peer set, um, that's where I came to those conclusions is I actually had a hard dollar amount that I knew I was producing, um, substantially in several multiples higher than a lot of my peer set was. And that, and that's where I thought, okay, well, why, why am I going to go and perform at this level when I can work half as much and get paid about the same? Well, and this is more than, this isn't ego and, you know, self esteem here. This is really facts and figures. This is really looking at it and saying a business decision. And of course you come from an analytics background where you were out consulting on how to read the SEO and how to read what's going on online. And you basically took those same skills and you applied them to your own life. And you said, doing an analysis on this, this is where I'm at and this is where I'm going in life. And then you made a conscious decision. So as you stepped away, I would imagine that there was, this is a difficult decision, right? You went from the the security of a nine to five or a, I guess nowadays it's like a seven to seven, but you went from the security of receiving a paycheck and, and benefits to stepping out on your own kind of into the unknown wilderness. You know, how was that experience? You know, I actually took a little different angle on it. First and foremost, uh, as I mentioned, I, I thought I was going to be an analytics consultant, just independent. And uh, I had a I had a non compete uh, with my company, and so I actually took a different job for a year before starting disruptive advertising, so that I could kind of wait out that non compete. And um, what's interesting is that during that time period, I had told uh, I reported to the CMO. I was the director of digital marketing there, and uh, I told him it was my intention to start an agency. Uh, in the near future. And he said, that's great. As long as you get me good results in the meantime, and you know, we'll just become a client when that time comes. And uh, during that year time period, I actually built a, um, a portfolio of clients that I was working with that was in a non-competing space where I started to do more of the consulting on the actual PPC AdWords, Facebook. Um, and so by the time I actually left my full-time job, I actually already had a book of business built to uh, be doing just as well, if not better, before making that transition. And that's not the way that everyone's going to do it. But given the fact that I was married with, with a couple of kids, I wanted to make sure that we were set up for success without taking too much risk. And so we took the time to save up some good money, get the business going well enough on the side uh, before launching. And you know, I'm, I'm sure, certainly glad we did it that way because it took some of that extra pressure off. I'm a big believer in it's it's you got to be hungry, but when you're starving, you can make compromised decisions. And uh, so try to put myself in that position where I was hungry, but not starving. I think this is a, a huge light bulb moment that the listeners need to make sure that they internalize and pay attention to. That 
it's important to be hungry. It's important to be at this point where you're willing to work hard and risk and, and move forward, but not so hungry that you're making compromised decisions. And Dan Miller has a great analogy for this where he talks about when you're ready to jump out of the boat, like imagine you're in a little rowboat and you're rowing along out there in the water. Hey, try to get your boat as close to shore as you can before jumping. Now, ideally, you can get so close that you can step out of your boat step onto the shore and nobody's going to get wet. Sometimes you're going to have to make that leap of faith where you're going to jump in and maybe you get your ankles wet or up to your knees. But there's no reason that you need to jump out in the middle of the lake and try to swim to shore. Really work on your business and your idea. Know where you're going, the direction you're heading, and try to get as close to the shore as you can before jumping. So Jacob, I want to transition back to the original thought that I was having. And that is, okay, now you jump out and you're going for business. How did you find these clients? How did you, you built this portfolio, this book of business while you were still kind of working in this non-compete scenario? How did you go out and find clients? Yeah. You know, I love, I, I'm a networker. I love to hustle. I love to do that. Um, obviously leveraging my personal network. My first client that I picked up was the, the company that I worked at while I was in college. And so just reaching out to the people that I knew going to networking events, those types of things. That's how I picked up my first handful of clients. And then from there, you know, really that that's kind of how you can build a lifestyle business, right? Pick up a, a small handful of clients to be working with to make enough money to get by. But really where the growth came from was implementing the types of strategies that we do for our clients. We, we set up our uh, AdWords and Facebook campaigns, wrote a lot of content and really started gearing that and targeting um, the audience that we wanted to be working with and setting up an inbound uh, lead channel that, uh, you know, people have always reached out to us. We've never actually, other than those first few clients of me reaching out to my personal network, businesses contact us. And um, that's that's how we've done it from very early on, and that's how we continue to do it now. Uh, it's just a difference in scale at this point. We have over 500 businesses a month reaching out to us for looking for help with the things that we do. And some of the best marketing that we can do within our business is just to perform at a high level. When you're doing good work for the companies that you're working for and with, referrals are natural. I mean, people are going to come and seek you out. Yep. Now, you talk about being a networker and going to networking events. And I would imagine that once a network all, networker, always a networker, are you still in the networking game? And what does that look like for the founder and, and business leader of a very quickly growing company. Yeah. There's a couple of groups that I've really valued uh, being a part of. The one that I would say I've definitely gotten the most value from is the Entrepreneurs Organization, um, a.k.a. EO. And I've gotten a lot of value from that. Uh, locally, there's a group called Corporate Alliance um, that, that I've been a part of. And I've also spent a lot of time uh, building my network on LinkedIn as well. And so those are the areas where I've, where I've invested the majority of my time. Well, let's talk about LinkedIn for just a minute here. And we're going to send all of the listeners over to your LinkedIn page to, to read that article. I'm going to link it up on the show notes. But I want to talk about LinkedIn and strategy for a minute here because over the last four months, I've really got highly engaged in LinkedIn. And I'm just impressed with the amount of good quality contacts that you can make there. And so I wanted to ask you your LinkedIn strategy and maybe a little pull back the curtain a little bit and tell us some secrets of how we can expand our network and really do it right on LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost, um, when it comes to networking and whether it's LinkedIn or anything else, if, if you don't truly care to create a relationship with someone, it's not sustainable and it's not going to work long term. And quite frankly, it's not going to be that satisfying. And so I think the first thing that we have to check at the door is, are we looking to just take value or are we looking to give it? And I'm a big believer in if you give value first and maybe even repeatedly with no expectations of getting something in return, that's, that's the way to approach networking and building relationships with people. And what's great about it is that when people uh, sense that sincerity behind the approach in that, Hey, I'm just curious, what makes you tick? Um, a lot of the things that I'm doing is I, as I look about on LinkedIn and network and do those types of things, as I find people that are just interesting and fascinating to me, I just ask them questions like, why did you choose to get your degree here? Or why did you choose this direction for your career? I'm just curious to see what got you from point A to point B. And 
that's that's where most of the more meaningful relationships that I've developed stem from is just asking sincere questions to learn about their journey and their experience without looking to make a sale or to do those types of things because those things almost kind of just happen naturally if it's a, if it's a good opportunity and the right fit. Well, we talk about sales being basically the alignment of somebody with a need and somebody with you know the opportunity to satisfy that need. And we all like to do business with people we know, like, and trust, people that we feel a connection to. And I think what you're saying is by going out in these networking events, and we talk specifically of LinkedIn, but this could be anywhere, any platform digitally or just in person, face-to-face, when you show a genuine, sincere interest in another person by asking questions, it lets them understand that you're not trying to sell them, that they're not a target. And I think people could read through your true intentions. And I think what you're saying is, by being genuinely interested in other people, you're gonna build a connection. And when you have that connection, well, the natural process of you providing value to satisfy a need that they naturally have is gonna naturally occur. Is that what we're hearing? 100%. Well, wonderful. Let's switch gears just a little bit here because you do some interesting things at Disruptive Marketing that you guys are proud of and I think could really translate well to a number of the listeners here. One is, let's talk about this $1,000 a week in snacks. Yeah, you know what? It's um, The snacks is actually kind of the boring part is we just spend a lot of money at Costco every week. We, what we try to provide is just, hey, you know what? You need a quick pick-me-up. You want a healthy snack. You want whatever. Like, that's there, right? There's good drinks. There's good snacks. And, and a handful of things there for people that might have had a busy day and, and didn't have a chance to go grab lunch or something like that. Um, but, I'll, but I'll tell you what's, what's a little bit more fun than that, and that's what we actually do on Friday afternoons. <laughs> We've got uh, a certain budget. Usually it ends up being about two to $3,000 a month where we just do random cash games. Uh, at the end of on Friday, usually around four to five, uh, four, four thirty. Anyone that's still in the office, we play paper, rock, scissors. We flip a coin. You call heads or tails. We throw stuffed animals across the room and land them on chairs. We roll balls across the room. Uh, and, and people are walking away with anywhere from 20 bucks to 500 bucks from these just random cash games that we play. And uh, it's just fun. It shakes it up. It's, um, we, we just do a lot of stuff like that to, to keep things fun and exciting and that it's not the same all the time. Well, I want to ask you how, what impact that has had on your co- company culture. You know, I would say that it makes it more fun, but that's not what keeps people around at Disruptive Advertising. Um, it, it makes it a fun environment. It has good energy. But really what, what we've focused on is building, uh, you, you'll remember that the reason why I had to end up starting my own business is I felt like, man, if I can, if I contribute this much and I get paid this amount or I contribute a lot more and I still get paid this amount, that was the mentality that really drove me to, to make a change in my life. And at Disruptive Advertising, all departments, our mantra is we don't penalize top performers. And so we have a compensation plan that if people want to perform more, they get more. And it is completely and, and, squarely in their court to do that. And they, they have, it's very objective to get promotions. It's very objective on how do I get additional bonuses um, or grow and progress in leadership in the company. Uh, And that's what we've done that I think has really created the culture that's attracted and keeps talent here because they know here's how I need to perform. Here's what I need to do. And this is what I get by doing it that way. And so people kind of start to go at their own pace and some people like to do it really fast and some people like to take their time. And either way, it works for us, and it gives them the flexibility to approach things the way that they want to and get back what they're looking for from that contribution. Well, and this has led to your philosophy that it's more important to make 50 millionaires instead of making $50 million. And I want to ask you about that mindset. You bet. That was the question that earlier on in the business, I always had this struggle of knowing what was my exit strategy? What was my end game? What was I really looking for? And because you get you get that those questions get pushed on you a lot as an entrepreneur. And it never felt comfortable for me to just, uh, to just have this motivation to build and sell a business. That's never been really exciting to me. And so I remember one day asking myself, man, am I, am I growing this to just make a bunch of money or would I rather, you know, get to the end of my life and, and have built meaningful relationships with the people that, that we did this together. 
And uh, one of the experiences that just really touched me uh, this last year was we had our annual revenue goal that we were working towards. And we're a recurring business model. And so we had a monthly recurring revenue number that we were working towards. And we got towards the end of Q3. We're moving into Q4. And in the company meeting, I said, hey, guys, it looks like we may need to readjust what what our goal is for the year, because I'm not quite sure that this is you know reasonable for us to get there. And Jake, what happened over the next two months, it still just blows me away. And it made me realize that it was no longer my goals in the company. It was our goals at the company. And to have these people that have joined the company and a lot of my leaders have come in and double, tripled or even more the income that they're getting from the short time that they've been here because of how they're performing. They now have um, stock options and other things in the company. Uh, we, we actively encourage and give them a budget to go and get training and develop the skill sets that are the most important to them uh, so that we can develop not just a millionaire from a financial standpoint, although that will be one aspect that I'm looking for, is giving them the skills that allows them to contribute to the world in a way that would represent a millionaire. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's an experience that comes to mind that's happened recently, but that, that's way more motivating to me than to make 50 million bucks. I want to build relationships with 50 people that we change the world together. And um, it's no longer my goal. It's our goal. And do you think that this is something that you've kind of grown into or is this something that you've always had that you've always kind of wanted to lift up those around you? Or did you start out like a lot of us where, hey, I want to build my company. This is my company. I'm, I'm the founder of it. I want to make a good compensation. And then as you've grown, did you grow into this or was this something that was always there at the foundation? You know, I think... To some level, it was always there. But the reality is, I think it's been more of a progression. And um, I think that I recognize that, you know, keep in mind, I I grew up in a family of 10 children in my family, 10 brothers and sisters, and not, you know, not a lot of money to go around. I mean, I've had a job since I was eight years old. And I remember thinking once upon a time, if I could ever make $100,000 in a year, I would be the, the happiest, most financially set, excited person I could ever be. And uh, I remember distinctly those thoughts, you know, and I didn't really have my 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 vision set that high because of what I was used to growing up with. Um, And so there came a time in the business and this was probably about a year and a half ago where I had far exceeded anything that I ever thought was even on the table for a guy like me in financial terms, in financial terms and uh, to, to show up to the office and drive in my sweet car and having this business that's successful and profitable and realizing that, oh, the money isn't what's even motivating to me anymore. Like I already have way more than I ever thought I'd need. And, and that's where I kind of realized what I was really looking for and what really motivated me is when I, when I kind of crossed that threshold of surpassing my expectations and realizing I'm more motivated than I've ever been. And it's not driven from the financial side of things. Well, and I thank you for sharing that part of the story with us, because I think as we're on this leadership track, as listeners to the podcast, we understand that success is a journey. And we understand that along that journey, we're going to take some detours and we're going to get off path a little bit. But one of the things that we believe, and that is as we grow and develop, things are going to be more clear or things that were not important or less important in the beginning are going to become more and more important. And you could see that through your story that it may have always been there, the understanding and the general nature that you have. But as you were able to kind of take a step back and kind of evaluate what you wanted in life and what how you define success, you were able to realize, boy, I define success in helping other people achieve their potential. And one of the things you talked about, and I wanted to go back to, is this investment in training for your employees. And there's some people that would say, don't invest in training your employees because then you're just going to train them up there and they're going to leave you. But you look at training as such a valuable part of keeping your team. How do you go about training and deciding what people can be trained in and, and work in that in your company? Yeah. And I think this really stems from the principle that we've discussed of, you know, our compensation plans are set up as such that a high performer is going to be compensated at a high level. So it makes it hard for them to want to leave, right? Because if they love their job and they're being compensated fairly, um, that means that that I'm doing my job as the business owner in creating an environment for growth. And so there's a few things that we do, and I don't know how different or the, similar this is to other groups, but we've invested a lot of time into 
what I would refer to as our internal Wikipedia, right? Uh, we call it the grid. Uh, we've invested a lot of time writing content, uh, training, quizzes, things for people to go through to really get up to speed. Um, and that's something that we've kind of developed our own in-house training module that people come in and go through that process. We've also structured our team so that everyone is tied to everyone, meaning as a manager, I only bonus and succeed if the person on my team bonuses and succeeds, quite literally. I mean, it, it's based as a percentage of how their team does. And so that's one of the things that we've just put in as a natural training incentive to say, hey, you know, you, you've got this team, you've got to build it, you've got the growth goals that you're working towards, and you're only succeeding when they are, so that there isn't this layer of middle management that thinks they're important doing good work for the company, but it isn't really making a difference. And so those are some of the things that we've put in place to help us do that. And then I still do weekly trainings where anyone that wants to come, it's optional, can come in. Uh, I can talk about some of the things that have helped us be successful as a business, equally talk about the things that have caused us failures <laughs> as a business, because sometimes there's more to learn from those experiences. But yeah, I mean, th those are some of the things that we do. Well, I think that's terrific. And that weekly training is something that I encourage a lot of our listeners to go out and try within their business. I've heard Dave Ramsey talk about in his company, every Friday, they get together, they have a team meeting and here he is, CEO of a million person company. I don't know how many employees they have nowadays, a lot. And he'll still spend 10 minutes teaching them about different aspects. And that's one of the things that when they inter do exit interviews that the employees really love. And I would imagine that you probably get a pretty high turnout to people just tuning in to see what you have to say and kind of learn from you. I think that motivation and inspiration is contagious. And the more we can get our team surrounded by the good, positive, motivating factors, the more motivated they can be. Now, Jacob, I love this conversation. I don't think we have enough time to get into too much more of it. But before we let you go, I want to jump over to the final section of this podcast, and that is a section we call learning from leaders. It basically adds a personal aspect to this business conversation. Sound like a plan? Let's do it. All right. So the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. Um, it's in Audible and it's Essentialism. It's the third time I've listened to it. Yeah, this is uh, Greg McKeon, right? Yep, that's right. This is a terrific book about getting yourself organized and in a place where you're putting most of your energy, as much of your energy as you can, into the topics and parts of your job that make the most sense. I agree with you. It's a great book and listening to it on Audible is absolutely the way to go. How about your leadership superpower? You know, I would say the leadership superpower is creating an environment for growth where we don't penalize top performers. And it's easier said than done. And I hope that the listeners to this episode kind of go back and listen to how you've described your business and how you've built your business. Because it's one thing to say, we're going to focus on training. We're going to focus on philanthropy. We're going to give people the opportunity to grow. And it's another to actually implement it. And so I appreciate that as a leadership superpower that you've been able to create environments where people can feel safe to grow and really motivated to take it to the next level. How about a motivational quote, mantra, or philosophy that you live by? You know, because I've just um, been listening to this essentialism recently, the one that came to mind was oftentimes we think the key to our happiness or success is by adding something to our lives. When what I'm finding more and more is that oftentimes the key to that success or happiness is removing something and just simplifying. And that's what I'm finding in terms of the, the amount of time that I choose to spend with my family versus work um, and those types of things. But, you know, there's probably something that can be removed that's going to make a difference versus adding one more thing. Absolutely. How about the book that you most often gift to colleagues and friends? Well, it's interesting. At, um, at Disruptive Advertising, we actually pay for an Audible account that we buy uh, dozens of books and everyone has access to be able to listen to those. And the one that, uh, that I have encouraged and been pushing the most recently is actually a book called Influencer. And uh, that, that changes the paradigm of that change takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to happen. And uh, so that's one that we've been spending a lot of time on and reading as well. 
And influence is one of the topics that we talk about the most on the Modern Leadership Podcast. Uh, Conviction, irresistibility, and accountability. For those who have been listening a long time, they know what I'm talking about. Jacob, I appreciate you coming on the show. Before we let you go today, do you have any last bit of advice? And how can we learn more about you and disruptive advertising and connect with you? Yeah, you bet. Um, You know, I'd love to connect with anyone here on LinkedIn. I think there's a lot that we can learn and share with each other. Uh, as far as getting a hold of us, one of the things that we are always glad to do is, is a complimentary audit and or a strategy session. Um, we've developed some pretty cool technology that helps facilitate that. And so if you're interested in learning more about how to grow uh, the business that you're a part of or your own business, is I would just go to disruptiveadvertising.com and reach out to us and we would love to go through that process with you. And we'll link all that up on the show notes for this episode so that it is a one-stop, easy for them to connect with you. Jacob, thank you for your time today and all your wisdom and what you're doing with disruptive advertising. You're inspiring small businesses and business leaders everywhere. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, Jake. Well, that was a fascinating conversation to really look inside a very quickly growing company. I mean, you look at four years, up over 100 employees, multiple millions in revenue. You know that they're doing something right over there at Disruptive Advertising. And as you listen to Jacob kind of walk through his mindset, the mindset that he tries to employ throughout his company and through his business, you can really see that it's a nurturing environment. It's an environment where people are free to learn and grow and really contribute. And when they contribute, they're compensated for that. And I think that makes for happy long-term employees. When people feel like their contribution is recognized, noticed, and compensated, well, then they work hard for you. They keep coming back. They want to do great things for you. And so I challenge you as you look at your business, What are some of the ways that you can make your employees, the people that you lead, the people who are following you and looking up to you as their leader, what can you do to make them feel empowered to work to their full potential? How can we get them to work at a high energy level, to be excited to come in and not just come in day after day, but to stay and help lead your company and lead your business? What are some of the changes that you need to make in your office? or in your surroundings that will make people around you want to be part of this team, will want to grow. And you know, for me, it's all in the mindset. You start between your ears and you figure out what it is you really want. You challenge yourself and then your team is going to come right along with you. Of course, everything that we talked about, including how to connect with Jacob is going to be on the show notes for this episode, which is jakeacarlson.com slash ml67. And that's where you can get the quote and the mantra and the book and all the stuff that we talked about. Of course, I look forward to seeing you next week on the podcast where we will sit down with another great entrepreneur, expert, or author. And uh, until then, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. Stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh